I'm Ralph Preston. William Lowe and I are back to do yet another roadmap. And uh, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the, we're going to go back to basics and talk about how to um, build on movement once you uh, start getting some movement, uh, how to get uh, involuntary movement, because that's what you really want. You want your brain moving the parts. And both of us have noticed that a lot of stroke survivors are led to believe that if you uh, simply move a body part with another body part hundreds of times over and over day after day that you'll get the motion back. Um, you might, but it's going to take a lot longer than if you take a focused approach. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Some things that you can do to focus in and build on the movement. And so, William, I think you had, I know you had some thoughts on this. So why don't you go ahead and start us off? Uh, yeah, sure thing. So I like to think of this idea as more of a, public service announcement because this is this is an idea this is something which i've seen a lot of stroke survivors who i've interacted with uh in my journey uh in my journey i have i've i've seen a lot of stroke survivors think that if they use their if they use their not affected arm to move their affected arm then that they can somehow get back some movement or in other words they can they can get back movement or they can improve their recovery through passive movement and while in some cases this might be true at the end of the day when we get back to basics when it comes to recovery after stroke it really comes down to re-educating your brain on how to send the signals from your brain to turn on and turn off muscles correctly just like you used it before your stroke now if if you're relying on something such as passive movement or if you're or if you've been led to believe to use your your um non non affected arm to 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 move your affected limb then it's likely that this isn't going to really work in your favor because when you're doing that you're not really giving your brain an incentive to actually want to improve or put some effort into wanting to send those signals from the brain which 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 have been damaged to try to turn on those muscles just like it used to before you had your stroke. So so the reason why I thought that this was really important to cover in this roadmap is because when it comes to recovery after stroke, it's all about, like I said, re-educating your brain. And what this means is doing exercises which create some sort of response in the brain. And a response in the brain really only comes down to situations where you're actually forcing your brain or encouraging your brain to actually try to put some effort into into trying to send a signal through to those muscles which are trying to turn on after your stroke for example in the very early days of your stroke recovery if you're trying to regain your walking uh one of the things one of the things your brain would do is your brain would naturally use your use your non-affected leg to 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 teach your affected leg how to walk because because some of the muscles which are close which which are used to which are used to control your non-affected leg they also help control some of the muscles on your affected leg to help help you walk as well but this doesn't but that only applies with the walking and this doesn't apply to your whole body as a whole and just because and just because you can you can use one side as a reference point to get the other side going, it doesn't mean that this applies throughout all of your recovery. You will have to you will have to find some way to to force your brain to put in some effort to actually get those signals going. Otherwise, if you're just sitting back and you're and you're moving your affected limb um, using your other limb, then you're probably not going to be be seeing seeing the results which you're looking for. Now, earlier, Ralph, you and I, we were having a discussion about this, and you and I, we had seen a lot of cases of stroke survivors where, where maybe they didn't necessarily have a movement, but they were, they were led to believe that doing, but that they were doing an exercise because maybe their their therapist was helping them to move their move their limb through that exercise, rather than them actually sending some signals from the brain to actually do it themselves. Just and you had some thoughts about this. 
Um, I was just wondering if you want to share some of those with the folks watching. Sure. Um, I guess somebody told me early on they didn't say anything about mental imagery or mental practice, but um, they told me that uh, if I did passive movement and thought about it, that it converted to um, active movement, and I found eventually it did. Uh, so that's one one of the uh, tricks that uh, techniques are not tricks. One of the techniques that you can use. Um, one of the things I found was it was I, I did some passive movement on things, uh, opening my hand and bending my wrists and things before even before I try to get movement to you know try and get some flexibility so you can go from there to there and 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 open the hand even if you can't open it um, all the way. But the, we're here more to talk about after you get past that stage. So. It's just kind of a thing that you build on in my experience where I was moving and moving once I could move them pretty much throughout the range. Then I would start thinking about moving them with my brain while I moved them with my hand. And then I would like to uh, try and move it less with my hand, see how much I could, uh, if I could do it at all. Um actively as opposed to passively because what you're trying to do is get rid of the of the uh assist um i'll let you talk about e-stem and some other ones the other one i used was bilateral therapy for like getting my hand back and and so if that's a concept of your we have there's a number of things going on. You've got to model your if you're doing like rolling your fingers, if you're doing them with your unaffected hand. I couldn't do them very well with my affected hand, and I noticed I could do them better. There's a couple things going on there. You you got the like visual for me. I'm real visual, so you got the visual model, but you also have um, a phenomenon or a fact, not a phenomenon, because it's a, fa a fact that. Um, <clears throat> Whenever you move your affected, unaffected side, some of the signals go over to your affected side. So you can uh, pick up on some of those. And that's what I did in terms of rolling my fingers. I'd roll them together like five times, then I'd try and roll them over here until it fell apart and then I'd pattern again. It's kind of like sending those signals over uh, repeatedly like that and then trying it on your own no matter how bad it looks, um, is is part of part of that process, or it, it was for me, because um, the 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 more you you get the positive signals, which in the case of bilateral therapy are coming from your other limb over to the other side, then the better. Um, I guess the, the better template is a word that you use, William, better template that your brain has for what that movement's supposed to look like and be like. So those were two of the techniques that um, I employed um, being uh, mental imagery or mental practice while doing the passive mo movement and also doing um uh, bilateral therapy and there's no reason you can't mix them I, I didn't especially but as I try things now it, it's possible to be thinking about it well of course you should always be thinking about it because mental imagery and mental practice work so if you're doing bilateral therapy I even talk to my hand come on hand you can do it anyway that's a real aside so I'll toss it back to you William because I know you uh, you had mentioned um, e-stem and some other things in our of uh, conversation previous to hitting the record button. Yeah, sure. So, so, so basically, what what we're trying to say here is is if you're trying to get back movement in recovery after stroke, one of the things which stroke survivors have been led to believe is that even if you don't have the movement back already, that if you just do an exercise where someone is moving your limb for you then you can somehow get back that movement. And in most cases, in 99% of cases, this doesn't work. For example, uh, I have I have some clients who have been told in the past, 
that if they simply just grab their affected limb with their good limb and they just move it 100 times, that they're actually going to get the movement back. And I've also had clients who have been told to to do a skateboard exercise where they're where they're trying to teach their brain how to punch their arm forward, even though they haven't gotten back that movement from their shoulder, only to end up not punching the skateboard forward, but to end up using their trunk to compensate and moving the skateboard back and forth, which isn't really teaching your brain how to actually punch forward. It's teaching your brain how to cheat and teaching your brain how to compensate. So, so what Raph and I are here and we're trying to share is that when it comes to regaining movement after stroke, you cannot you cannot get back movement by just guarding your affected limb through that movement without actually thinking about it because this is likely going to result in a situation where you're teaching your brain to actually compensate and cheat by turning on the muscle groups which are easily able to be recruited through, for, for, for example, the big, large muscle groups such as your upper shoulder or or some of the muscles such as your hip, which is which is why whenever some stroke survivors walk, they they hitch their hip quite a lot. But rather, it really comes down to educating your brain on how to send that signal, or at least attempting to send a signal from your brain. So and also following that with movement so that you can try and give your brain something to latch onto so that it can learn how to send those signals through. For example, some of the things which Ralph mentioned uh, where where he used mental imagery, where he would perform a movement and he would use passive move, passive passive movement to prepare his uh, muscles to actually do exercises. These are great examples because when you are passively moving your limb, what you can do in order to to facilitate that um, facilitate that movement of relaxing your fingers, for example, if that's a goal which you're looking to achieve, is you could try and send a signal from your brain to try and relax your fingers while you are stretching out your while you are stretching out your fingers with 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 your right other hand at the same time. And so what this does is you are you are getting your brain, you are giving your brain a sort of prompt to sort of jump onto so that it can learn how to send that signal itself. And you're just using the assistance from your non-affected hand to guide your brain in that right direction or police in that right direction. So, so that's basically what Ralph and I are trying to explain here is that unfortunately a lot of stroke survivors have been led to believe, and I believe by by uh, a minority of therapists, that if you simply just move the limb in a certain way, or if you just guide, 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 guide the limb in a certain exercise without actually having gotten the movement back, that you can somehow facilitate a connection. But 99 cases, in more than 99 cases or not, this doesn't work. And you have to be, if you are going to try this approach, um, it is it is much better to be strategic about how how you send that signal through from your brain and how you're going to re-educate your brain on how to send that signal through to actually turn on those muscles like you used to before your stroke. So one of the one of the methods, one of the methods which I like to use and I'm a big fan of is functional electrical stimulation. And the reason why I like electrical stimulation is because electrical stimulation basically it uses electrodes to actually help contract the muscles and and give give your brain the experience of what it feels like to to perform a movement and also experience what it feels like to actually send a signal from the brain to actually turn on the muscles at the same time. So not only do you have the feeling of turning on the muscles, you also have the visual of what it looks like to actually move move your muscles at the same time. And, and this is really powerful because when you think about mental imagery, it's more or less the same thing. Only with mental imagery, you're probably going to have to work a lot harder using your imagination but when you have that visual imagery, which you get from mental imagery, that can also be a good stimulus to also get your brain firing. For example, some exercises, some some exercises in stroke recovery, they 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 use a mirror to actually give your brain a strong visual of what it feels of what it should feel like to actually move the affected limb, just like you used to before your stroke. 
So what I'm really trying to say here is that in re- in recovery after stroke, like I said, it's all about educating your brain on how to perform a movement before you had a stroke. And you can't do you, you cannot start this re-education process by by just using your non-affected limb to move your affected limb a hundred times, but rather you you need to have something to allow your brain to latch onto, whether this be a prompt or whether this be a cue to actually let you know let your brain know that it's doing it correctly or give your brain the experience of what it looks like and feels like to actually perform a movement. For example, with Ralph, um, what what he found was beneficial was the use of mental imagery. Whenever he would prepare himself to perform a movement, he would imagine the movement and he would imagine sending the signal through, uh, whether this be doing it first with his, doing it first with his uh, non-affected side first, and then transferring that feeling over to his affected side to try and replicate that. And what this does is, again, it allows your brain to latch onto something to to get an idea of how to send that signal through from the brain to actually turn those muscles on. And the reason why this works, especially in Ralph's case, is because some of the connections from your brain, they they cross both hemispheres as they go down towards your hand, as they go down towards your arm and your leg. So so whenever Ralph is performing or imagining a movement with his uh with his non-affected limb and he's trying to transfer it over to the affected limb, the brain basically takes a Polaroid picture of the blueprint or the uh, template, which is required in the brain to actually get that movement going on the non-affected side, and it tries to transfer it over to the affected side, and it tries to put together the pieces of what it should feel like to send that signal from the brain to try and turn on the same muscles in the exact same way or as close as the exact same way as it did on the non-affected side on the affected side. So I think this is really powerful because in recovery after stroke, like I said, a lot of stroke survivors unfortunately have been led to believe that if they perform something or if they perform an exercise without necessarily having gotten the movement first required to actually perform that exercise, that they can get back that movement through that exercise itself. But it actually doesn't work this way. And you're much better off trying out something, trying out something first and and seeing seeing if you've got some movement back first, or in other words, flickers of movement, which is something that Ralph and I have talked about before. And if you have gotten back some flickers of movement, being able to build on that movement be- until it becomes tangible and until it becomes something that you can naturally see and something you can do automatically. And once you can do it automatically, you can transfer that to something, transfer that to a task or an exercise where you are actually forcing your brain to put in some volitional effort to actually perform that task. So for example, um, I believe Ralph has mentioned on many occasions how how he noticed one day how he was able to move his, sorry, open his fingers about a sixteenth of an inch. So what he did is he recognized that that was where his brain was giving him the green light, that this was his opportunity to jump on the movement and keep sending that signal through from his brain to strengthen his ability to open his fingers until it was tangible and w- until it was tangible and he could do it on demand. And once it was on demand and tangible, he could transfer that to real life until it became a lot stronger and his brain was able to build up that scaffolding and that template or that blueprint in his brain until he was able to perform it unconsciously, just like it was it was it was it was just second nature. So so that's basically what so that's basically what Ralph and I are trying to really get at. And I think this is really important for all strokes of others to know. Uh, like I mentioned at the start of this roadmap, I believe it's a more of a public service announcement because, like I said, at the end of the day, recovery after stroke, it's about re-educating your brain on how to send that signals. And you can't run before you walk. So most of the times you will have to learn to walk before you can actually run and what that means is you need to lay the foundations for how to send that signal through and at least get to a point where you can actually send the signals through from your brain to perform a little bit of a movement until you think about integrating that to an exercise. Or if you are performing an exercise, rather than allowing someone who is assisting you, such as a therapist, to do most of the 
exercise for you, for example, 80% of the movement by guarding your arm or your leg, you at least have to put in 50% of it of the effort by sending a signal from your brain to try and do the same thing. So Ralph, you and I, we we also talked about this and you've and you've and you've seen a lot of stroke survivors who have who have made who who have been led to believe that they can that they can get back movement purely by by doing exercises, even though they might not necessarily have that movement. For example, uh if 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 they were led to believe that a fitness approach such as lifting weights would help them get back movement in their recovery after stroke. And I know you had some thoughts on these. I'm just wondering if you want to share some some of those with everyone watching. And 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 also if you had anything to add with what I shared. Sure. <clears throat> More to add or clarify some things I said, uh, no particular order. Um we were talking about the the bilateral stuff. And I I read uh, I read that um approximately fifteen to twenty percent of the signals from one side of your brain go to the other side. So, you know, that's not insignificant. Um, I asked both a neuroscientist and a neurologist, and they said, well, 20 maybe, everybody agreed they were at least 15%. So it's not like 1% or anything. There's there's something there to work with if you can figure out how to how to harness it. So that's one thing. In all the times I've talked about mental imagery, I, 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 when I've done the thing with my hand where I said they told me to stare at my hand and imagine it moved it, uh, I've talked a number of times like I did today and talk about like moving, passively moving your hand. I'm a visual person and part of the whole mental imagery, mental practice thing is the imagery part. So it's one of the things you should uh you should look at and watch because the brain uh, responds to um, multiple things better than single things. So the more input you can give it, uh, in this case, that visual input, um, more input, the better. The other thing was I didn't really mention the word. Uh, I talked about, you know, opening your hand and, get, uh, and getting movement through the not movement, but being able to move throughout the range of motion, well, that's basically stretching. So if, if if you want to like learn to you know open your arm all the way, but you put your arm down and it stops and it's locked here, you got to work on on uh, you know passively uh, it, without pain. Well, working that hand down till you can till whether you can move it actively or not. You're not going to move it actively until you can open it all, all the way. So I guess what I was really talking about in that, uh, the preliminary thing is, um, you know, s stretching. Um, so those are my thoughts. Let's see, weights. You mentioned weights. I'm a big believer in reps. I don't, I don't think adding weights is particularly beneficial until you've got, you um, pretty good active movement throughout the range of motion because I think otherwise well lots of things can happen you can uh, a lot of people tend to think more more is better so you can end up with too much weight and that's not a good thing I I I, I really just concentrated on getting back being able to you know move everything uh, either not that was bilaterally uh, just move everything, you know, in all the ways that you should be able to do it. And that comes from um, doing things like uh, isolating the muscles and, and not falling into the whole um, compensation trap. Early on, I would find myself, I'd hook my foot around the bottom of a chair leg and stuff to like pull myself up and do almost anything. So you're always transferring muscles. So Part of this process is to not do the, if you want to do the roller skate, there's nothing wrong with it, but um, you really don't want to do it like William said, when, you know, you're compensating, um, you know, you ask people to do things sometimes like lift up their arm instead of like lifting up their arm, they'll 
lift up their whole shoulder to get that, try and get that arm up. So in this whole process, you got to try and you're also trying while you're stretching and while you're trying to get um, active motion controlled by your brain back, you're also trying to uh, block and isolate muscles and, and uh, be aware of compensating and using the wrong muscles because that's something that your brain will just do to you automatically um it's an insidious thing like we've talked about before it'll take the easiest path and the easiest path is compensation and you're not paying attention then that's what you're going to do so those are my thoughts do you have anything else william uh well no uh i don't think i have anything else to add I just really hope that uh, for all the folks who are watching this, uh, really, really take this to heart because it can be very easy. It can be very easy to, to, to get caught up with the idea that you can, that you can just get movement back by just passively moving, by just passively moving your affected limb or just allowing your therapist to just do 80% of an exercise for you by just guiding your limb through that exercise. Um, and in recovery after stroke, it's a lot harder to actually come back from from years and years of doing the wrong thing. And it's much easier to get back recovery by just having a targeted approach and knowing knowing how to do the right thing first. Okay, well, um, so the recap is uh, learn how to isolate and um, if you need to block muscles so that you don't do compensation while you're working on stretching to get the actually make the body part go through the whole range of motion because you're not going to move it voluntarily and unless it you can at least move it involuntary uh, passively and to uh, look at it and think hard and or use e stem or bilateral therapy doing the same thing on both sides. And so there's kind of like three things you're juggling at the same time. Uh, don't compensate. So stretch to get the range of motion and use a focused approach on, um, on switching from passive to um, active movement. So, William, thank you, as always, for your time. And we'll see everybody next time on uh, Roadmap. Yeah, no worries. Thank you for having me, Raph.